Hello and welcome everyone. So now we are going to discuss on structural performance during earthquakes. So by now we have discussed on the performance of the substructure. A structure has two parts: substructure and superstructure. Now for performance of substructure, we have discussed liquefaction of the soil and how do we mitigate the effects of liquefaction. And we also have discussed the interaction of the soil and the structure. How do we, how do the SSI affects the structure, and how do we analyze SSI? So after understanding substructure performance, now we are moving to the superstructure performance, especially the elements of the superstructure. How do they behave? So let us begin. What is the cause of the force? What is the force which affects the superstructure? And that force, especially in case of earthquake. that force which affects the performance of superstructure that is called inertia force and inertia force when it comes in our mind then we can think of the inertia as per the newton second law of motion it says a body wants to stay maintain its position it has a tendency to continue to remain in the previous position if it is at rest it wants to continue the rest position so similarly when earthquake forces start shaking the base or the ground then the foundation starts moving with the soil but the structure due to having its own inertia due to having high mass it wants to remain at rest so naturally the ground starts moving like this okay but the structure wants to remain at the same position so this is how the inertial forces starts developing on the structure okay so this is inertia force and this is earthquake force okay so this inertia force will have certainly some magnitude and uh, if the roof has got a mass m now in any structure we assume that the mass is lumped at the slabs or the floors or the roof okay so this mass of the slab is here that is denoted by letter m this mass is the mass of the floors and the mass of the half story below and the mass of the half story above okay so all three masses are added here to get the mass at a floor slab all right so if the roof has got a mass m and it experiences the acceleration a then from newton second law of motion the inertia force fi will be equal to mass into acceleration and this is the fi force all right so this inertia force will be in the direction opposite to that of the direction of earthquake forces of course and uh, the magnitude of inertia force is directly proportional to mass of the structure so when the structure is light then the shaking from the earthquake will be easier to sustain the inertial forces will also be less on the lighter structure so they can sustain earthquake shaking very easily and they perform better okay so this u is the relative displacement of the building with respect to the ground now this when we talk the direction of this earthquake force now earthquake shaking is happening in all the three direction that we have studied as per cartesian coordinates the, there are two horizontal axis x axis and y axis these two axis are the axis on the plane or on the ground or on the earth but there is another vertical axis that is z axis and along this vertical axis is the gravity being applied now we design a structure for the gra all the gravity loadings like dead load or live load or any imposed load that comes that uh, these all are gravity loads so earthquake shaking is happening in all the three direction theek okay? hai so when the acceleration due to earthquake is in vertical direction so that acceleration due to earthquake will be added to this gravity or subtracted to this gravity 
and we know that structure is already designed by incorporating certain factor of safety okay for the design of a structure to resist the gravity loads so even if the loads increase in vertical direction z axis so structure will remain adequate against all the vertical shaking due to earthquakes so we need not worry much for the vertical shaking of the buildings what is principal concern is horizontal shaking and it occurs in both the direction x axis as well as y axis so inertia force will be along both these axis okay so there will be some loads which will be along the walls and perpendicular to the walls along the slabs and perpendicular and along both the direction of the slabs okay so let us begin how this how does the inertia force is transferred from the roof slabs or the floor slab to the soil now this load transfer is being shown here and this can be understood by the load path also now this load path or load transfer both are almost similar okay so let us understand how does this inertia load is being transferred from the slabs to the foundation to the soils so, so we know that the mass of the building is being lumped at the floors so under horizontal shaking of the ground the horizontal inertia force are generated at the level of the mass of the structure that is at the floor levels now these lateral inertia force which is parallel to the floor slabs are being transferred to the from floor of walls to the walls or the columns first of all this transfer happens from slabs to the beams and from beams to the walls or columns and from these columns to the foundations okay and from foundations to the soil beneath the foundation so this is how load is transferred so when we are going uh, for the design so design of all these structural elements must to be considered uh, by taking in account of this inertia force also and this inertia force will be transferred from the slab to the ground only when all the elements are having good end connections proper connections so connections between them must be designed to safely transfer these inertia force to them okay let us take a common example what happens in our traditional design what is the defect traditional design construction of a building floor slabs and beams are given prime prime attention you design the slabs you beams the you design the beams properly and what about the walls nobody cares about the walls and especially unlike usa or european countries where wood is being used uh, as a uh, infill walls in our indian scenario what we use as a walls masonry bricks and masonry brick is what it's a brittle material it's weak in tension and we have you heard of design of walls especially masonry brick walls there is no such design of these walls unless we go for uh, eqrd earthquake resistant design so what happens there are collapse or out of plane failure in these walls now why out of these plane failures so when there is a wall like this okay wall is having some thickness so this wall generally fails in out of plane means when load is applied in perpendicular direction now load can be applied in two direction one is along the wall and one is perpendicular to the wall along the wall it can sustain very easily all the loads but load which is perpendicular to the wall the wall will fail wall will crumble out of plane and it will fall on the person or the car in the street okay so this design has to be done there properly now in case of hilly region uh, the walls are made up of stone masonry walls okay especially in uttarakashi or uttarakhand region but in any situation you take any rcc building all these rcc uh, 
construction these infill walls are made up of masonry walls only and when they are not designed to take this uh, transverse load or perpendicular load because walls are relatively thin and made of brittle material then they will be very poor in performing uh, when the loads and now earthquake load can come in both direction this direction x direction as well as y direction so earthquake load in x direction it can take very easily but not the y direction okay so these walls or columns are most critical elements in transferring the inertia forces so that's why i have taken this failures of machinery walls here so let us move to the architectural features architectural features that affect the performance of the building severely now let us take the accounts of architectural features one by one so let us take first of all the size of building now when the buildings having one of their overall size is much larger or much smaller than the other two you try to understand if one dimension like a building with which is too much tall in which h is too much larger than the dimension other two dimension of the building that is a and b plan of the building so these buildings will not perform very well similarly a building having too much length l which is too much higher than the height of the building as well as width of the building so they will also perform not very well in the building similarly when the plan of the building is too large here a and b is too too much large than the height so the, here one parameter one size of the building is too much smaller than the other two so this type of building will also perform not very well in case of earthquake so this is how the size of building becomes also a concern in performance of a structure let us move to the horizontal layout of the building that is called as plan okay now this is horizontal plan so simpler the plan the buildings perform better if a plan is as simple as an hexagon now why i take this hexagon because hexagon has got three axis of symmetry the more number of axis of symmetry is there in your structure the better it will perform during an earthquake similarly there is a square building so or rectangular building they will perform also very nicely because they have two symmetry of axis but what happens if there is uh, only one symmetry of axis like this this is a t shaped building or uh, this semi circular shaped building they will also perform very nice at least uh, they have at least one axis of symmetry okay so if you take uh, the example of our college that is also having one axis of symmetry and they will also perform very nice but what about the plans in which there is not not at all even one axis of symmetry like this l shaped building what about this or what about the shape of a building which is having a size like uh, this jet shape then in these case we have to provide some separation joints you see this separation joint here this is the separation joints and these separation joints they make the complex plans into simpler plans so we just have to provide one separation joint here we have to provide two separation joints here and these separation joint will make the complex plans into simple plans and simple plans say buildings perform very well during an earthquake so this is about horizontal layout of building what happens in vertical layout of building if there is sudden setback in the vertical layout you see this there is a setback there is a setback there is a setback setback means sudden change in the profile vertical profile of the building so there is sudden decrease in the stiffness of the building at those level the the earthquake cause severe damage and mostly the failure occurs at that floor levels similarly if we have a weak or flexible story now a weak story weak story is also called as soft story now this soft story can be of two types when you increase the length of the 
uh, height of the columns okay then the story becomes unusually tall so those story becomes very soft or very weak or very flexible or another way is that you do not provide any infill walls you do not provide any walls just to fill even masonry walls if you do not provide so that becomes a soft story example now these uh, walls resist the horizontal loads and walls are pr present in both the direction so they resist uh, to a significant degree the earthquake loads but sometimes we do have to provide weak or flexible story when we have to provide parking facilities or we want to make a story uh, for some special auditorium or for showroom or for special designs then in those cases we do not provide parapet walls or any infill panels so in that case it becomes a weak or flexible story so that story is severely damaged in earthquake okay so similarly if you take a building on the slopey ground in a hilly region so you can see the length of the uh, here height of the columns are different they are not uniform so these structure will perform very poorly during an earthquake okay now take us uh, let us take the example of hanging or floating columns now you can see this column this column and this column there is no column below these three columns and if there is no columns below any columns then that column is called as hanging column or floating columns because of these hanging or floating columns there is disturbance in transfer of load path from top to bottom to the foundation to the soil so due to this hampering in the transfer of load inertial load transfer these columns are severely damaged okay similarly we have discussed this discontinuity in the structural elements so this sudden deviation in load transfer path along the height or the vertical direction lead to poor performance of buildings so these are different uh, examples of performance of a structure during earthquake let us take one more architectural feature that is the adjacency of building that means proximity of one building to the another if the neighboring building is very very close to one building of course the two buildings will have two time periods ta and tb both will have certain frequency and if the frequency of one building this building matches with the frequency of the earthquake then they will be in resonance and they will shake more than the neighboring buildings and that will cause ponding action this ponding action is caused by the uh, the shaking of the building neighboring building and if the slabs are situated at different level you can see this is here and this is here slab is situated at different level so in that case the damage is not only caused to uh, the one building but the adjacent building also and this is called pounding pounding is the hammering of one building with another building you can see this example so this is how one building cause damage of another building and in this case it may happen that if this building could have remained far from this adjacent building then this could have sustained the earthquake load uh, in that situation but due to uh, adjacency it is severely damaged and in another case what happens tilting of the buildings also cause a severe damage to the neighboring buildings this is the example where one building is tilted and and has damaged the other building now this happens when there is soil liquefaction due to ground shaking then what happens the geotechnical properties of the soil is lost and then there is a differential settlement and due to that there is tilting of buildings although the entire structure remain intact but when they tilt or fall down they cause severe damage in the adjacent neighboring structures so this is how the structure performance uh, is uh, uh, affected due to different factors uh, during earthquake so we will be discussing the next part in the upcoming videos till that stay tuned and stay safe thank you